Okay, thanks. Um, somebody asked me if I was going to convert you. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm listed as the author on the talk, but a lot of what I'm going to talk about actually uh, comes, uh, in terms of the science results, comes uh, from this paper, uh, which Nasser Metbell was the lead author on. Uh, there was a lot of input from Phil Wanamaker and my colleagues at OSU, Anna Kelbert and Adam Schultz. Um, so uh, I, I guess most people here have, have heard that MT is a component, has been a component of the US array, transportable array, uh, and it's, it's kind of mimics the seismic uh, in some respects, 70 kilometer nominal grid spacing. Uh, we're taking long period MT data, so that's a period range of 10 to 20,000 seconds. Typical site occupations of 20 to 30 days, if everything works. A few have been longer. Um, uh, this is a plot of all of the uh, sites that have been completed. You'll see that's one difference from the seismic. Uh, it isn't complete coverage of the continental U.S. at this point. Um, I guess there's about another 11 sites actually in the field as of yesterday, or maybe 12. Uh, I'm going to talk primarily about, um, let's see if I can make this work, um, primarily about uh, this array here, this footprint here, uh, 325 sites from the northwestern U.S. Uh, in which the analysis is pretty mature. And I'm going to just say a few words, very preliminary results from inversion of this mid-continent rift uh, array. Um, so I, I guess one of the points that I want to make w with regard to, to this uh, session is that uh, the Earthscope MTTA uh, has a really large spatial scale uh, covering continental or part, substantial parts of the continent uh, in each of the footprints. It's an aerial as opposed to a linear data, linear data coverage. And uh, those two facts necessitate a very wide site spacing compared to what was done previously with magneto tellurics. And I, I would say that it's probably the first MT array of this sort. And I think this is one of the great things. I think I, I'd like to convince you that this is one of the great things that came out of this Earthscope project is this additional sort of component, which was done in the way that it was done probably to be compatible with the seismic and not necessarily the way that the MT people would have liked to have deployed this data. Um, it, it's it's uh, the first, I think, but it's not the only now. Uh, there, there's a, a similar project uh, going on in China now. The Sinoprobe, uh, MT component of Sinoprobe has occupied uh, the, these two large footprints, um, one in northeastern China and one over the Tibetan Plateau. Um, and uh, so to summarize the rest of what the talk is going to be, um, uh, first off, I, I want to sort of start with a little bit of MT basics. We seem like we feel the need to sort of explain some of the basics to everyone. I'll make it brief, uh, but I, I guess one of the things I want to emphasize is the kind of what was the standard 2D paradigm before uh, this Earthscope pro uh, uh, MTTA project. And then I want to show you uh, some of the results from the MTTA array with a 3D inversion approach, and uh, there's really sort of three uh, components that I want to emphasize. One, this has provided a, a broad view of how ubiquitous high conductivity layers are in the lower crust and the upper mantle in the active west. And uh, this is, uh, the interpretation of this is that it's related to fluid and magmatic processes, uh, fluid resulting from magmatic processes. Um, and uh, a second uh, point I want to make is that the large aperture allowed by this array allows resolution of deeper lateral variations in resistivity uh, to the LAB and beyond. So it's, it, we can sort of see where, we can sort of in some sense map a, uh, a, a, the LAB in the western U.S. And, uh, and see lateral variations in possible hydration state at greater depths. Um, and then finally, uh, poking through all of these things, there, there are uh, conduct, conductive suture zones are very common, and these record uh, the assembly of the continent. And with this large scale, you can kind of start to see this pattern of, of, of the different where things have, have, have come together. Um, so first, I'll start with electrical conductivity and why should we care. And the main point is, is that uh, uh, most rock-forming minerals are, are highly resistive. And so when we see very high conductivities in the crust and the shallow upper mantle, it's usually telling us something about the presence and uh, interconnectivity of fluids, and that could be partial melt, water, CO2, other volatiles, and a few very conductive minerals which can organize themselves into conductive uh, structures, uh, sulfides and carbon. 
Um, the, the texture and interconnection of these conductive phase is going to be very important, and so we should expect anisotropy uh, in uh, conductivity. Uh, if you go deeper, um, so solid state conduction in the mantle is thermally activated. Um, there's just kind of a, a, a little cartoon of the, of the different mechanisms. Uh, at, the, at the lowest temperatures, proton conduction uh, is the most important. And what that means, what that translates into is that small amounts of water can increase conductivity of mantle minerals dramatically. So this is a, a laboratory result. So temperature on this axis, uh, log 10, uh, water content in PPM on this axis, and the color scale is log conductivity. And if you go across at, say, uh, a mantle adiabat temperature, there's a, there's a very substantial, maybe up to two orders of magnitude, variation in conductivity of olivine as you go from zero to 1,000 ppm water. So there's a lot of uh, sensitivity of mantle minerals to water, so, so EM has the potential to sort of be a way to sort of understand something about hydration state. There's some evidence for anisotropy, uh, but as it says here, results between labs are not completely consistent. Uh, there's a, a couple of different groups that have argued extensively. Uh, and, and my conclusion is that these high PT experiments with hydrous minerals are difficult to do because you have something that's volatile and you've got to keep it where it's supposed to be in order to do the experiment. So MT, uh, basically very briefly, we use external magnetic field variations which are caused by global lightning and solar wind magnetosphere interactions. And th these cause induce electric, uh, electromagnetic fields in the Earth which propagate into the Earth as a diffusive phenomena. And uh, so deeper penetration uh, happens for lower frequencies, uh, shallower penetration for higher frequencies, and more resistive minerals, uh, materials, uh, also allow deeper penetrations. So that's MT in a nutshell. Uh, well, I guess a couple more nutshells. Um, <laughs> uh, so the basic data that we measure are uh, time variations of the magnetic and electric fields on Earth's surface. So this little cartoon here down, rep down here represents that. So uh, a couple of uh, uh, non-polarizing electrodes buried in the ground, some instruments to measure the magnetic fields, coils here. So we can measure the uh, electric and magnetic fields. And then we estimate a transfer function, which gives a frequency-dependent relationship between, well, we we lost something here, between the magnetic fields and the electric fields. Um, and uh, this uh, frequency-dependent uh, relationship is called the impedance, uh, so that it's a tensor relationship between the two horizontal magnetic components and the two electric components. And the fact that these off-diagonal components are big and these diagonal components are small says that Bx is primarily related to Ey and By is primarily related to Ex. And you can formalize that in a, a, a two-dimensional case. So you have a preferred geologic strike. And if you sort of express all of your vector magnetic and electric components in the correct coordinate system, the coordinate system of the strike, then it reduces to this basically uh, off-diagonal impedance tensor. And there are really sort of two independent modes, T, which are called TE and TM. And it's the frequency dependence of the impedance amplitude and phase, these are complex things, so there's a phase difference between electric and magnetic fields, uh, the depth, that can be translated into the depth dependence of earth conductivity or resistivity. So uh, here's, a, here's a cartoon of the two-dimensional uh, earth model, a, a conductive fault zone, a profile of stations across it. This is a, a TE mode in which the electric current is flowing parallel to the strike. Uh, there's another mode of, which is the TM mode in which the electric currents are flowing perpendicular to the strike. And you'll notice that there's a substantial difference between these. Uh, the TM mode, TE mode is all smooth and uh, this fault sort of goes away at long periods. The TM mode uh, has this discontinuity at the fault and that's because of, to maintain continuity of the currents across the fault the electric field has to be discontinuous. Um, so uh, if you, uh, and this is sort of a, a source of a, of, of a challenge and one of the reasons why people were worried about 
uh, having high, you know, this sampling strategy, putting the data very far apart. If you have, uh, if you just put some additional sort of very shallow structures in here, you also put in these apparent resistivities some uh, static shifts that basically affect all periods and contaminate the, uh, the underlying signal. And of course, uh, even if you sort of had, even if this, say, is, is a, a reasonable cartoon of, say, the San Andreas Fault, and that's what it's intended to be, um, and it really is kind of 2D at a very large scale, there's still going to be surface features which are going to be 3D. And they're going to contaminate both modes, the TE and the TM mode. Um, so uh, the standard approach, uh, which, which I would say was kind of the, the standard uh, paradigm for, for MT, and it really is still a very commonly used and, and really very useful approach, is, is basically to take data in a profile to get enough data, high enough density data, to sort of model the very near surface structures. And so this is a, this is a picture from uh, of high, very high resolution MT profiles across the San Andreas Fault. Uh, actually at the site of the Safod hole. Um, and the, the strategy is basically to analyze the impedance, find the most 2D strike direction, and then you only interpret these off-diagonal modes. Um, and you can emphasize maybe the TM mode, maybe the TE phase, throwing out some of the components that you think are going to be hard to model or under-resolved in the data sampling that you have with only a single profile. So uh, EarthScope, uh, so the, the, the array that I'm going to mostly talk about has 325 stations, 70 kilometer site spacing. Uh, this is a, a tectonic map. The reds and blues are uh, Cenozoic volcanism. Um, and so it, it spans an area very complex and very geology. So it's not like a, a, a dense profile across the San Andreas Fault where there's a very large scale structure. It's very hard to find any kind of 2D profiles out of this. It goes from subduction zone and arc. Uh, there's extensive recent magnetism. There's the extensional basin and range. And then there's some stable cratonic interior. It's a very complex 3D area, and it's very hard to take two-dimensional profiles out of this. So uh, uh, I think it was fair to say that when this was originally proposed, uh, a lot of people, uh, some MT people in particular, said, how is this going to work? Or really, actually, I think they said, is this going to work? And I think there was some concern that basically near surface complications were going to make this sampling strategy, you know, basically not work very well at all. Um, so uh, I'm not sure how well this shows up, but these are interpolated maps of apparent resistivity and phase for these off diagonal components. Uh, so there's no preferred geologic strike, so this is just in geographic coordinates. So these columns here, are the phase. These first two, these one and three are the apparent resistivity. Uh, so that's kind of the amplitude. And in fact, you sort of see this kind of static effect because going from 100 seconds to 10,000 seconds, they all look fairly similar. And so they're all shifted up and down site to site by these kind of statics. On the other hand, the phase shows much more, it's smoother and it shows much more consistent and systematic variation over period as we see to different depths. And that's consistent with the 2D pictures that I showed you. So our approach to this data set was uh, to apply recently developed 3D inversion methods. And uh, I, I'd say that this is just becoming practical when the Earthscope data was available. And we still have a lot to learn. Um, so the inversion code that we used was the so-called MODEM version, in, inversion that uh, I and Anna and Nasser Metbell developed. Um, and our strategy was to basically invert everything, the full impedance tensor. I didn't say anything about vertical magnetic field transfer functions, but there's an additional kinds of data that we can invert too. I admitted, uh, we fit all 325 stations, we admitted about 3% of the data. Um, and we did many, many inversion runs, and I'm really going to be showing you results from a, from a single one. And I think a key point here is we just sort of said, okay, these near surface static distortion effects We've got enough parameters and degrees of freedom in the model. We'll just hope that, they, that we can actually um, fit the data well enough. So here's, a, here's an example of a data fit, say at a period of 100 seconds. Uh, the measured data here, predicted data here. So remember, there's basically two essential modes. North, the currents are flowing north to south here, east to west here. Um, and 
you can see that just visually we fit the data quite well. And then just to sort of jump, just to preface what we're going to sort of see, these high phases here that are seen in this general area here are indicative of very high conductivities in the lower crust. So now let's turn to the model. Um, this is a, a representative cross-section from the preferred 3D conductivity model, and there's several things to sort of show you here. One of them, there's a, there's a very resistive oceanic lithosphere, uh, and it's, it's really not probably so resistive here. It probably is a conductive asthenosphere here. Uh, there are very high conductivities, as I sort of already alluded to, in the lower crust, and sometimes this is going across the Yellowstone, Yellowstone Snakes River Plain. Um, the high conductivities extend into the mantle. There are resistive protonic areas, and there's kind of a general uh, 20, 30 ohm meter conductivity uh, here, and what, what it we'll see is probably the asthenosphere. Um, so, looking at uh, in plan view, um, the extensive high area, the first point that I want to make is that there are extensive areas of high conductivity near the MOHO. And this is a 31, 37 kilometer depth range. Um, you can see uh, elevated conductivities beneath the Cascade Arc here. Um, there are elevated conductivities th throughout, in this area throughout the basin and range. They're truncated at this so-called Klamath Blue Mountains liniment right here. Um, the highest uh, conductivities are seen beneath the Snake River Plain, Eastern Snake River Plain. Um, and the most plausible explanation for this is that these are uh, probably some melt and magmatic fluids, fluids released from uh, exhaled from, the, from magmas upon crystallization uh, and hybridization, and uh, probably, I guess, over here, subduction-related fluids. So I don't really have much time to talk about the details. Um, there's a couple of other areas of high conductivity here. There's this, and they all correspond with well-known um, uh, rifts or uh, old continental sutures. So this is the uh, Great Falls uh, tectonic zone. This is the Belt Basin. This is the Cheyenne Belt. So all three of these, of these zones here are probably very old fossil features, uh, they're probably not the same cause as the fluids and melt that are in the uh, active tectonic west. So these high conductivities extend into the mantle, um, and you see resistive provinces uh, beneath the cratons, and so this is the Medicine Hat Craton, the Wyoming Craton, also the Colorado Plateau shows up as being resistive, and uh, uh, beneath the uh, Columbia Plateau. Uh, is also a very prominent re resistive feature. Um, another, another thing to notice here is uh, that the, the high conductivity seems to organize itself. The co high conductivity in, it seems to be interspersed with more resistive zones, and they seem to organize themselves in streaks and stripes, which are actually about uh, the width of the station spacing. So it's a little bit hard to take seriously that those are necessarily structures that are resolved. Uh, it's entirely possible that these represent a much finer scale of anisotropy, which allows current to flow more easily in one direction as opposed to another direction. And with the current station spacing, we can't really distinguish that scale of anisotropy. So it could be, it could be down to the level of, of, very, of microscopic anisotropy. Um, uh, Interestingly enough, the direction of maximum conductivity also matches the fast axis and seismic anisotropy estimates. This is from Lin et al., and you can see that there's a, a reasonably good correspondence between the direction of these, uh, of these streaks and the fast axis. Um, uh, at, at the time, right now, I think that the conductive anisotropy probably can't be explained by LPO. Uh, and that's be because some lab results, at least, show that uh, there's a relatively weak effect of water on conductivity at these temperatures, and the highest conductivity would actually not be in the right direction. Um, that's still sort of something I think that we need better lab experiments to sort out. But this is a, uh, another interpretation, then, of what, these, of, what these, uh, of what this might be, is orientation of, of melt in cracks, uh, and that also would all cause the same 
sort of a seismic anisotropy. So um, moving on to um, going and coming back to some of these uh, uh, other features that I mentioned. So this is the Great Falls Tectonic Zone, the Cheyenne Belt. And uh, in this, this, this model, I've actually included some additional data up here. And there's another sort of conductive anomaly that goes across here. And uh, if you compare this to um, uh, the, uh, the assembly of the uh, uh, Proterozoic continent, there are these, these features here correspond one for one. So this is basically the Great Falls Tectonic Zone. This feature up here is this one here. And this Cheyenne Belt down here is this one here. And so this is one of the other things that we sort of points that I want to make is that we, that we see these uh, zones of high conductivity. And in the models, at least at this point, we need to investigate this more, these zones of high conductivity extend through the lithosphere. So here you have these very resistive uh, uh, Archean blocks, Medicine Hat block, Wyoming craton, Hearn craton, separated by these uh, very deep extending vertical zones of electric, high electrical conductivity. And uh, the standard interpretation of these, they've been seen around the world and uh, discussed widely, is that uh, these deep crustal conductivity, and it's actually, this is saying it's going not just in the crust, but through the lithosphere, are, are due to graphite and sulfide, uh, which was subducted during uh, uh, continental assembly. Okay, so an another thing that we can see is, uh, that we looked at is um, uh, conductivity at greater depth. And uh, to do this, we sort of divided this, uh, our, our model domain into different patches, which were kind of, kind of quasi-uniform at different depths. And we comp computed average 1D resistivity profiles between these regions. And I'll just show you those quickly. So um, uh, th this, is, this is in the active west. These are some of the patches, these uh, dash lines, which are in the more stable interior. And uh, I, I put on here um, uh, a conductivity profile that you would expect from the lab experiments for uh, dry olivine. And here, um, a uh, profile with uh, 350 ppm water. And the conclusion is in the active west, uh, basically by 70 or 80 kilometers, you're actually sort of seeing conductivities which are very consistent with, uh, you know, asthenospheric mantle temperatures and actually a, a, a dry asthenosphere. So our interpretation is that basically here we're seeing a dry, basically dry, a very, very thin lithospheric mantle uh, and essentially near, in shallow depths down to a few hundred kilometers, essentially dry asthenosphere. But at greater depths, the, the, some hydration is required in order to match the conductivity. Um, the situation beneath the stable interior, of course, is different. Now the, the, the resistivity is much higher, uh, down to 250 to 300, 250 kilometers or so. And that's consistent with basically a you know, cold uh, lithospheric mantle there. And uh, at, at greater depths, if anything, the asthenosphere has to be more strongly hydrated. So kind of the picture is, again, this is... Basically, there's a very thin, um, very thin lithospheric mantle. It's essentially dry in this area. All that fluid has been taken out by melt, which is up here. And a lot of, it, the wa a lot of what's actually causing the conductivity in the crust is actually that water having been released again. Down here, you require some water still, some hydration, in order to sort of match the data. There's some hint that things are getting more conductive as you go to the east, but let's come back to that. Okay, um, I think I'll just skip this to sort of have time to finish this. Um, uh, so so uh, I, I want to just give you sort of a little bit, a few slides uh, of our preliminary work on the Mid-Continent Rift. And so, as everyone knows, the Mid-Continent Rift hosts this uh, spectacular uh, gravity anomaly. This is the Bouguet anomaly. Uh, and we've done sort of some initial inversion of this data set, which is 226 sites, similar uh, strategies uh, to, to what we use on the uh, Northwest, but this is a little bit less mature. Uh, Bo Yang, 
uh, is, is taking the lead on doing this. Um, and I just want to show you a few slides. Uh, shallow structure, you, you, you clearly see, I guess this is the Michigan Basin here, and there's some evidence of actually high conductivities at very shallow depths in the rift itself. And I, I haven't looked at this in great detail, but I'm assuming that this has something to do with uh, just sediment, shallow sedimentary structures. Um, the, if you look in the, in the lower crust, in, uh, and I'll, I'll contrast this with, the, uh, with the, the, the active west in a second, the main feature that you see is there's this um, patch of, of spotty high conductivity uh, that goes through here, and this is basically sort of corresponds with uh, the Pinochian, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, Pinochian uh, province, which was uh, accreted to the superior craton about 1.8 to 1.9 uh, GA. Um, so again, this is probably one of these uh, suture zones where, you know, carbon and sulfur were subducted during accretion of a, of a terrain. And I think one of the interesting things on this is uh, th there's, there's kind of evidence here that basically the rift has sort of uh, melted out and reset this, this suture. So basically there's a break in the suture where the rift appears. Um, just, just to sort of emphasize this point, the high conductivity near the Moho, ubiquitous in the west, in the active west, it, it's really not here at all. So remember there were some other features here like this and like this down here and this up here which are probably comparable to this, and they probably represent, uh, you know, zones of suturing and sulfides and graphite, something that's not volatile and can't go anywhere. These fluids and melt, which are not going to stick around for a billion years, are completely gone from here, of course, and it's completely stable. Um, I guess th th there's some artifacts in this, in, this, in this picture that I just showed here. There's high conductivities outside of the area of the array, and there's very high conductivities at great depth in this array, and both of these things are sort of on the edge of our coverage. And uh, there's a big question mark here because we didn't, haven't had the data to fill this in. And I would, I would emphasize that, uh, well, we know, we know for a fact that there's a whopping conductivity anomaly associated with the trans Hudson origin um, in this area, and I think full coverage of the U.S. is warranted. Um, uh, this is just one last slide. Um, except for a conclusion. So uh, this is, this is a, a, a deeper layer, 200 kilometers, and there's some evidence that it's more resistive beneath the western arm of the rift. So that could be thickened lithosphere or perhaps uh, sort of modified lithosphere um, due to depletion during the rifting event. So um, I think um, this MT, uh, TA array plus 3D inversion, inversion approach work seems to work quite well, and I think it's given us, um, there's, a, there's a, a number of other things, and obviously a lot of this stuff could be gone into much more detail. It provides a broad view of high conductivity layers in the lower crust and uppermost mantle, and it really gives us, I think, some confidence that these are really sort of a common feature of active areas and not of stable areas. Uh, the large aperture is beginning to allow us some resolution of deeper lateral variations in resistivity, which I think could sort of provide some valuable information on hydration state in the asthenosphere. And uh, conductive sutures record the continental assembly, and they show up very clearly in these things. Um, and uh, if I can, I'll click on this, and it will rotate. And uh, if there's questions, we can do that.